The third Democratic debate will feature just 10 candidates on one night, meaning for the first time viewers will get to see a contest with all of the top contenders. Plus, Castro and Klobuchar. Having these 10 and only these 10 changes the dynamics at play for this debate. In this video, I'm going to break down what I think each candidate should do in order to secure a win. I'll also give you my predictions of what they will do to help answer the question, who will win? Amy Klobuchar, throughout most of the primary process, has thus far been typically thought of as a mid-level candidate. Not a top choice, but by no means the bottom of the barrel. For the third debate, she is the second lowest polling candidate to make the stage, and probably the most likely to be totally forgotten about. This change only puts more pressure on Klobuchar to create a standout moment. The easiest way to stand out is to go on the offensive against a more popular candidate. As a moderate, Klobuchar is probably most politically aligned to Joe Biden, and would thus be potentially most benefited by attacking him aggressively, much like Kamala Harris did during the second night of the first Democratic debate. Klobuchar has little to lose, and Biden has little to gain, so a direct conflict with him would have a high probability of breaking in her favor. While that may be the most effective tactic for Klobuchar, I highly doubt she'll pursue it. Through the first two debates, Klobuchar has generally pursued a non-confrontational approach. She'll criticize general views she doesn't agree with, but she tends to not directly challenge particular candidates. She also does not tend to inject herself often, but typically patiently waits for her turn. While this less aggressive approach may be well appreciated, it tends to lead to less screen time during the debate and no one talking about the candidate afterwards. Klobuchar is not likely to become the most Googled candidate or have a moment go viral if she sticks with this approach, but that's exactly what her campaign needs to do in order to survive. For this reason, I expect Klobuchar to be a loser for the third debate. Julian Castro is the very lowest polling candidate to make the debate stage this time around, but his fate may be quite different from that of Amy Klobuchar. Castro had a strong night in the first debate, and a little less so the second time around. But there's good reason to expect he'll pull out a W this time. Since the event is in part hosted by Univision, we can expect that candidates will make special effort to appeal to Latinos. That will more than likely translate to extended discussions about immigration and an attempt by far too many to communicate in the Spanish language. Both of these factors will be an advantage for Castro. Immigration has become a signature issue for Castro's campaign, and he's managed to score points on Beto O'Rourke and Joe Biden on the nitty-gritty of border-crossing laws in past debates. With both those candidates still on stage, he'll have a good chance to go in for a second round. When it comes to speaking Spanish, we've already seen that Beto's Spanish could use a little improvement, and Booker's is just absurdly weak. La situación, pues la situación ahora es inaceptable. Es de presidente ha atacado, ha demonizado los inmigrantes. Julian Castro has actually faced criticism in the past over not speaking Spanish well enough, but he's still probably the most fluent to make the debate stage. The only candidate who would reasonably stand to gain more from a Spanish language pissing contest would be Pete Buttigieg, who would likely gain more credit for learning the language despite not having Latino roots. Pete Buttigieg, of course, speaks eight languages, and nine if you include Klingon. I made up the Klingon thing, but probably, right? Probably. While Buttigieg was a rising star throughout the month of April, his numbers have been sliding rather steadily since early May, and he remains firmly planted in fifth place just behind Kamala Harris, who has also been losing ground. While framed around characters like Tim Ryan and Eric Swalwell, Buttigieg looked like a first-tier competitor. This time around, he's a mid-level contender. While a top-tier candidate can generally benefit from just keeping it together the whole night through, a mid-level candidate has to play a more aggressive game. It would probably be too off-brand for Pete to launch a Gabbard-style attack on one of the top competitors, but in order to keep his campaign alive, he's got to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Biden, Warren, or Sanders. And he's got to debate them at least to a tie. Unfortunately for Pete, I don't see this happening. 
As exhibited in the second Democratic debate, Warren and Sanders are highly effective when they are playing defense against an aggressive challenger. By challenging them, Mayor Pete would risk his nice guy brand and risk losing the exchange. It's not a risk I'd expect him to take. Challenging Biden or Harris would be another route to gaining ground, but I can't say I'd expect that either. As a relatively popular young candidate who doesn't currently have a particularly powerful position to protect, Buttigieg is likely hoping to be a VP pick if he fails to secure the nomination. Who would pick him as a running mate? While well, the most likely possibilities would be Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. Biden's ticket could certainly benefit from an infusion of youth, and Harris might be tempted to go the Obama route, choosing a white man to endear herself to less liberal-minded voters. Pete's generally good on stage, so I don't expect an epic fail from him, but he's likely to take a conservative, non-confrontational approach, which won't gain him any ground in the polls. Like Buttigieg, Beto O'Rourke was once an adored shiny new think who has been gradually falling out of favor. He took a big dip in the polls while Pete was on the rise and has been generally polling between 2 and 3% since June. Stuck now in the doldrums of 8th place, Beto needs to prove himself to be the star he seems to have always thought of himself as being and do it in a way that smashes the expectations of doubters. Having gained a reputation for style over substance, Beto would do well to hit the books and come to this debate with clear, specific policies and deliver them without dithering, hesitation, or ambiguity. While Beto appeared rather nervous in the first debate, he did manage to show some improvement with a stronger, firmer presence during debate two. This shows he's able to correct for problems, but the kind of changes he'd need to make to get a win would be rather drastic. Beto has always presented a kind of boyish charisma, but it's easily outshined by the light of Mayor Pete, who is younger, sharper, more confident, and undeniably more boyish. When Beto is in a direct back and forth during a debate, despite being one of the taller candidates on stage, he somehow manages to always look smaller and weaker than his opponent. He's also never been able to present himself with the kind of forcefulness that seems second nature to candidates like Castro, Warren, or Harris. Beto truly needs to make a moment for himself in debate three in order to continue his run with any hope of victory. I don't expect to see that, and predict debate three will be a loss for Beto O'Rourke. Pulling around the same area as Beto is Cory Booker, who likewise has a rather light touch when it comes to debating. Booker does not have the kind of forcefulness that some of the other candidates have, but despite struggling in debate one, managed to turn things around quite a bit the second time around. On the day of the second debate, Booker was polling around 1.5% and has risen to 2.5% since then. This kind of movement tends to go unnoticed, but that's actually a huge improvement. And I believe his second debate performance was a key factor in his recent gains. Booker was able to confront Biden passionately and firmly but with a smile on his face. He was aggressive without seeming mean-spirited and seemed to really enjoy himself on stage. All he really needs to do to secure a W is to repeat that kind of performance. The only thing that could really get in his way would be a takedown from another candidate, but still a relatively minor candidate, it's unlikely he will draw serious fire. He'll probably take home a win in this debate. Like Cory Booker, Andrew Yang showed marked improvement from debate one to debate two and there's good reason to expect this trend will continue. I tend to think his weak performance in the first debate was really about jitters and a learning curve. After all, Yang is not a career politician, so being in a debate was more unfamiliar to him than anyone else on stage. To maximize his impact, Yang would probably want to make a moment, and as I've said before, this is most easily accomplished with the takedown of another candidate. That's not really Yang's style, so I don't expect to see it but there are other more subtle ways he can improve his performance. For instance, Yang has thus far done a great job of driving home his message about UBI, but he has not spent much time discussing his other ideas. Yang's website is actually filled to the brim with excellent policy suggestions, and I think if he spends more time discussing his ideas for healthcare or campaign finance reform, he's likely to pick up support from forward-thinking voters who have thus far considered him to be a one-trick pony. Now in the middle of the pack, Yang will probably have more of an opportunity to do this than he had in previous debates when he was granted less speaking time than other candidates. 
Yang is, in my view, very likely to make the third debate a definitive win for his campaign. Kamala Harris, perhaps one of the strongest debaters amongst all of the Democratic candidates, had a horrible night in debate two. She was absolutely crushed by Tulsi Gabbard and saw significant losses in the polls since then. Harris is not likely to allow a repeat of this performance. For debate three, not only does she have the good fortune of not getting pitted against Tulsi Gabbard again, she's also slipped enough in the polls that Warren and Sanders aren't likely to see her as a serious threat. I know expectations are down with Kamala Harris after her second debate performance, but I'm expecting her to come back strong. Having lost significant ground, she's going to want to come back with sharp one-liners and strong lines of attack against other candidates. I expect the prosecutor will come to prosecute and has all of the skills needed to dominate the debate. Debate three, I expect will be a win for Kamala Harris. Another powerful debate performer has been Elizabeth Warren, who spent debate two in a tag team match with Sanders against virtually everyone else on stage. And she was also a clear winner in debate one when she was the only major candidate at basically a kid's table. Debate three marks Warren's first opportunity to appear on stage alongside Joe Biden, who she has been heavily critical of in the past. Warren has proven her unwillingness to go after Sanders and Biden is the only other candidate presently in her league. I have little doubt Warren will come to debate three ready to knock Joe Biden around. She's a powerful debater, and I expect her to secure a win. As for Joe Biden, well, he's not likely to show up unprepared for an attack from Elizabeth Warren. In debate one, he seemed unprepared to get forcefully chewed out by Harris, but he returned for debate two in fighting shape. He may have ultimately proven himself unable to keep up with the multitude of attacks that came his way, but he had clearly planned for the bout. I would be shocked if he didn't come prepared for Elizabeth Warren. Just what exactly he will say to try to bring her down, I have no idea. But he'll have some attacks prepared, I have no doubt. Ultimately, as the top polling candidate, Biden's strategy for the debates thus far seems to have been to get through it without losing too many points basically playing defense. I believe that this is the right strategy. He doesn't need to go after anybody, but he's got to be prepared to defend his record and counterpunch when attacks come his way. And yet, I can't help but notice that after both debate performances so far, he's seen significant slippage in the polls. The debates have so far been bad for Biden. It hurt him when Harris came after him, it hurt him when everyone ganged up on him in debate two. If Warren goes after him now, as I expect she will, I have no reason to believe that history won't repeat itself. Especially given the fact that if Biden attacks Warren, she can expect backup from another powerful progressive. Bernard, Bernie, Field the Burn Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren have been sharing the number two and number three slots since mid-July. No doubt at some point they may have to joust each other to determine who will be the progressive champion of the primary contest. But I don't think they've reached that point quite yet. In fact, they probably have a secret deal not to attack each other. Naturally, like Warren, Sanders would likely stand to gain the most by going after Joe Biden aggressively. This is not generally his approach to debates in this or any other primary. He has always been as passive and policy focused as possible, only getting heated when he's put on the defensive. If I were running against Sanders, I'd probably avoid challenging him. Left to his own vices, he generally talks effectively about his own platform, but doesn't do much to prove that he's a fighter, which would in turn win over new voters. But I don't expect Harris or Biden to leave him be. Biden, who is still recovering from attacks on all sides, is likely preparing for attacks from his ideological antithesis in the democratic field. And while it's not exactly strategically beneficial for Biden to attack Sanders, he's not exactly known for his restraint. Harris, who has been slipping drastically in the polls, knows that she's gotta go on the offense to gain back lost ground. And Sanders is a likely target. Several other candidates and even the moderators are likewise likely to put Sanders in their crosshairs. Once attacked, Sanders will defend his record and policies and he tends to be good at this. We're likely to see a strong performance from Sanders in the third debate. 
So if you're keeping track, I'm only really predicting losses for Biden, Beto, Klobuchar, and to a lesser extent, Buttigieg. This leaves a long list of potential winners, but they're not likely to all gain significant ground from this debate. So who's likely to make the most headlines and become the most Googled? For me, there's two standouts. Andrew Yang, having received relatively little hype from the mainstream press early on, does have the opportunity to grab significant attention if he delivers a flawless performance. He's got a great underdog story and still a relative mystery in this field at least, he could pique enough curiosity to win most Googled. Kamala Harris is another likely choice. People love a good comeback story, and from where I'm standing, she's got the makings of one. She's got strong debate chops and took a serious L last time around. I'd keep my eye on Kamala Harris. So that's what I'm expecting to see in debate three, but it's hard to be sure with predictions because fun fact about the future, it hasn't happened yet. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section. What do you think? Who will win?